Hey everybody, welcome to Sprague Wood Turning. My name is Jim. If this is your first time being here, this is predominantly a wood turning channel where I teach people how to make products on the lathe each week. I do do a little bit of flat work every now and then, but it's predominantly lathe work that you're gonna see here on this channel. And this week we have a commission from Craig. Craig lives in Wales and this is a commission for his wife. And what he wants is a vase for his wife that's Welsh flag inspired. So we're gonna take some of this uh, maple burl and combine it with the colors that are on the Welsh flag and hopefully make a really cool vase. So the first thing that we need to do is get the pieces cut for our casting bucket and we'll get some resin mixed up and we'll go from there. So the first thing you probably noticed on this piece is that it's really resin heavy and that is by design. In order to get the colors in there that I want it, I knew that I was going to have to use a fair bit of resin. Uh, there I'm just showing my circle cutting jig. And again, there is a video on my channel showing how to make one of these and its use. Uh, it actually works very well. So in order to get those flag colors in there, I knew that I needed a fair bit of resin. So uh, there's certainly a higher resin to burl ratio in this piece than a lot of the pieces that I do. It's always a good practice to try and get rid of all the bark that's on any of your casting pieces, unless it is truly on there good. And in this case, it certainly was on this piece. That bark is on there. Let's see if we can get some of it off with the wire wheel. The wire wheel in this case actually did very, very well. Uh, it wasn't really a whole lot. Uh, bark left on it after this but it does take a little bit of um, pressure and the lathe spinning at 3000 rpm to get it done i'm going to be using the rice method here to calculate the volume of resin that we're going to need for this piece if you haven't been here before this actually is a very effective way to measure what volume you're going to need so that level there is six and a half inches deep and that is well over the manufacturer's recommended depth of pour, so we may get some thermal cracking, but I think that if I can keep the resin level at that level, that it should be a pretty neat looking vase. I think that maybe, I don't know, just, just a, a semi-closed vase would look quite nice. I don't know. Do I give it more? Oh man, it's gonna be a lot of resin. Yeah, sure. All right, that's eight inches. And I think we're pushing our luck there, so uh, let's see what happens. All right, so the way this works is, uh, when you're using the rice method, you multiply the volume by 1.4, and that will give you the amount of resin that you need to come up to the eight inches here. Sorry for the noise, noise I got my door open, uh, just to air this place out. I just blew it out with the, uh, Leaf blower, so it was quite, uh, it was quite dusty. Let's uh, pull this out and see what our level is. I might be a little scared. It's a lot here. There's two liters. Well, that's four liters. Wow. Well, we'll call it five liters. Five times 1.4 equals seven liters. Yikes. That's more than half a kit. Ah, yeah, let's do it. There, while that's setting up, let's mix up some resin. Since this is such a deep casting, we're gonna be using deep casting epoxy from Designer Epoxy. Uh, volume and depth 
is an issue when it comes to working with epoxy so that's something that you should always pay close attention to uh, in this case I'm finding that you can get away with a lot of deeper pours with deep cast than you can with a lot of other epoxy um, manufacturers that I've seen here on YouTube all right so here is the Welsh flag and as you can see it is white green it's got a cool red dragon on it I wish we had a red dragon on our flag so the colors that we're going to use are Ferrari red emerald green and pure white that's why I've divided this into three buckets the uh, these are going to be our two main colors and of course the red will be in this one and you know this is meant to be subjective I mean I, I definitely want to get that color separation within the vase but you know I'm, I'm not going to carve out a dragon and stick it in there it's just um, I just don't it's not really my skill set so anyway let's get this mixed up here I thought about this after if you poured a slab of red and then carved out a dragon and then placed it into this casting then when it's turned it would look distorted because it's round if you had the ability to bend that after it was carved and then place it in the casting then i think you may have some success as far as it not looking all distorted but if it goes in flat and it's round it's probably going to look distorted when it's finished well, what do you think did we do well on our colors i wish this was a little darker but it's pretty close i might have to add some dry pigment to it to get it to where i want it possibly a touch of black too unfortunately i don't have a liquid black so i'm just going to put a tiny little bit in here just to hopefully darken this up just slightly i don't it's close i just want it a little bit darker so we'll just start with a little bit and go from there black is such a powerful color that uh, you got to be really careful when you're trying to mix your colors up here because if you put too much black in it it doesn't take a lot to overwhelm it and then um, the color's not gonna look right so there what do you think I think it's pretty darn close I'd like to see that green a little darker I might try and throw some more liquid green in here this is starting to harden up on me so I think that a lot of the strong pigments may be on the bottom of it so I'll give it a good shake and give it some more but other than that what I'm going to do is throw these in the clean room where the heat is and I'm going to put them by the register and then hopefully we'll be able to pour these later on today. Anyway, we'll see you then. Okay, so it is eight hours after the initial mixing. Uh, we're at 76 degrees, so we have got to pour and oh, just going off really fast. Hopefully I haven't left it too long. Darn. I just want to pour the red on one side here and on the other side. <laughs> We're definitely going to get some color separation, that's for sure. And I was just out here a half hour ago and this was sitting at 56 degrees and that's how quickly it climbed. I bet you this is almost at 90 now. Oh. Ah. That is not the way that I wanted that to go. What a mess. Well, looks like we're going to have the colors all right, but they're not going to be uh, shaped like a flag in any way remotely. All right, I got to get the top on this and get it pressurized, and we'll see you. Uh, well, this may this may actually cure overnight. It's so hot. Well, good morning. I uh, just pulled this out of the pressure pot. 
Uh, forgot that there was water inside of it and splashed it all inside the casting, but that's not going to matter because things are set. So anyway, I'm just going to dump this out and I, I don't know if we're going to have thermal cracking in here or not, but uh, I thought it'd be best to pull it out today and have a look at it. This is about two and a half days after first mixing. So anyway, I'm hoping that there's not going to be any thermal cracking, but if there is, we can address it today and that way finish this tomorrow. Or at least start on it. While I'm never a fan of putting water in castings like this, because there's a lot of things that could go wrong, uh, this was suggested in the comments a number of times over the last couple of years anyway and this piece did not thermal crack so when I did take it out the water was actually warm so it did act as a heat sink and I can't say for sure that it prevented this from thermal cracking but um, it didn't so you got to give it credit thanks for the suggestions there that was easy That was, uh, that wasn't bad at all. Not as bad as I thought it was going to be. It's funny the, uh, well, it's not funny. I, I guess it's probably normal, but the red is, seems to be quite dominant in here. And it, it actually was the least amount. That area is really cool where it's all kind of combined. I don't see any thermal cracks. That's a big, huge bonus. I mean, this thing is, uh, it's a lot of resin here. Eight inches is what the depth of that is. So having that that heat sink in there of that water to draw heat away from it, I think really helped. Uh, it looks good. Uh, I was when I first looked in on the top and I just seen this where it was looking kind of pink. I wasn't too thrilled about that. But you get a little deeper down into it, and I don't think that it's going to be so much pink. It's going to be more red. This is going to be really cool when it's done. It's going to be a neat looking object. All right, well anyway, I'm not going to do anything with this today. It was killing me. Uh, I just had to get a look at this and, and see, uh, see if it needed to be, uh, have some kintsugi uh, done to it or not, and that's not the case. Anyway, I'm going to throw this back in the clean room because it still feels a little soft in some areas, and I'll leave it overnight and we'll be at it first thing tomorrow. See you then. So in order to mount this piece between centers, we're going to have to get some sort of a block on the top of this. So I'm just flattening-ish off the top of this, and I'm going to glue on a birch piece. I almost put it upside down, which wouldn't have been good. And then, of course, we'll get our center on the very bottom and get it mounted on the lathe. That's pretty good. So the water, um, I believe, was the effective thing here to keep this from thermal cracking. To one thing that maybe I should have done was put a lid on the top of this loosely, not tight, but I couldn't find it or else I would have. And the reason why I say that to put it on loosely and that's just to allow the inside and the outside to um, get to the same pressure. Over the years when I've done a lot of these hollow forms where I'm combining say two pieces of wood there's been a lot of comments where people said well why didn't you use a balloon and fill it with water and if that was being casted on the bench and not put in the pressure pot I would say yes that should work. There is still the risk that possibly that balloon could rub up against a sharp piece of wood and then break. And then, of course, your casting would be destroyed. But the theory of hydraulics, because a, a liquid is not compressible, it, it works and it doesn't work in this regard. If you take 
a lot of people, I, I mean, I've seen this a lot in the comments about using balloons and putting water inside them. So if you put water inside of a balloon and then it goes inside of the casting and then you pressurize it, well, there's a good chance that that balloon is going to compress and it may possibly even burst. And then, of course, your casting would be ruined. The way it, the re, actually, there's some really nice pearl just pointing that out on both sides. It's actually quite nice. So that hydraulic fluid needs to be contained in a cylinder that can take the uh, pressure that it's going to create. And a balloon won't do. Unless there are some super strong balloons that I've never heard of. And by all means, please leave a comment down below if you've used some sort of a bladder and fill it full of water and you pressurized it and you didn't have any issues. But this is why I've never ever used a balloon inside of my castings uh, filled with water or with air for that matter because <laughs> if you fill it full of air, once you pressurize it, the balloon's going to shrink and then it's not going to work for you anyway. Now, if that balloon is full of rice and it's open at the top so that it, the pressure can be equalized on both sides of the balloon, yes, that would work. But I find it easier just to stick with the two kitchen bags and fill them with rice and not deal with any of that other stuff. So, you know, over the years, I've seen this question a lot. Why didn't you do this? And that's why. But uh, by all means, leave a comment down below and tell me what you think about that. I am no physicist by any stretch of the imagination, but I was a mechanic for 19 years in the Army and we did deal with a lot of hydraulics. Just one last thing about water balloons. So if you put water into a balloon, and just to make sure that I clarify this, and then you tie off the top of it and then put it inside the casting, when the casting is pressurized, that balloon will push in itself and maybe pop out the top or burst. So that's what I mean by, I don't think that it's a good practice to try that. Um, anyway, I just want to make sure that that was clear. And again, beautiful, beautiful burl. Can't go wrong with maple burl. Awesome resin too. Okay, so what do you think about our shape so far? I want to go a little more like this. Uh, this casting, as far as I can tell, only has one small little bubble in it right there. But it's right on the high point of this. And, you know, I don't, ordinarily I would turn that away. But uh, what we're going to use is just a little bit of UV epoxy from Designer Epoxy to fill this in, or UV resin, sorry. And if you haven't seen this before, UV epoxy is cured with a UV light. Ooh, look at that. Ooh. Very cool. Anyway, I'll throw this on here for three minutes and then we'll trim this up. I think that I'm gonna make this smaller on the bottom uh, for sure, but uh, I'm a little worried about how thin we might be getting, so we'll have to see. Anyway, I'll bring it back here in a minute or three minutes to be exact. Here's one of those zoomed out views that people seem to really like. I did clean up around the lathe and I was collecting shavings. Here's a stack of them there. So we'll use them in a future project. I should say that we are using the number three Hercules from Hunter Tool Systems. Just a fantastic tool to, to work with difficult pieces like this. And I do highly recommend all the Hunter Tool lines and tools. And speaking of tools, uh, I've been getting a lot of emails and a lot of comments in regards to what tools should you buy to be a wood turner. And you know, if you were just going to do bowls and with no resin or anything like that, then really all you need is probably a 5 8 bowl gouge and a parting tool. That's, that's essentially what I used for many years. I didn't really use um, many other tools. Don't get caught up in buying sets of tools because I personally, I bought two sets of tools and maybe use one or two tools within that set. So I would recommend buying tools as you need them and stay away from sets because 
that can be quite pricey. You can buy cheaper tools that don't, say, cost so much uh, if you want it to try working on them. But I just buy the tools as you need them because a lot of times you buy these sets, you're just not going to use all of the tools in the set. There was a couple of uh, little holes in the bottom of these two pieces of wood where I used the circle cutting jig. So I had to turn away enough material to get rid of them. And I prefer to do that before uh, doing anything on the inside. You need to get your bottom set so that you know that it's good before you install your waste block. That way when you trim the waste block off, you're not going to have any issues and you don't have to put in a deep mortise to get rid of, say, a hole that's been left behind from the circle cutting jig. If you remember, when I put that birch piece on the very top of this, I didn't use a lot of glue to hold it on and I was a little worried about the vase breaking free while working on the bottom tenon. So that's why after I remove the tailstock, you don't see me do any turning. Just chisel away that nub and then grind it away with the drill. So now it's time to remove the, <laughs> the birch piece on the top. And I could have used a parting tool and gone in here, but you know, again, why risk it when there's really no need to? So the Sawzall did a great job cutting it off and I'll be able to reuse that birch piece in a future project. With this hanging eight inches over the um, off the headstock, this was a little risky to do this, but uh, it felt secure, so I thought that I would, I would give it a go. Probably would have been best to put the steady rest in place and then um, deal with that, but I knew that I wanted to fill some stuff here, so I thought that I might have to do that on the very top. So that's why I did it. And there's just some tiny little cracks in the burl, and there was a little bit of bar conclusion left behind, so I wanted to make sure that that got hit with the thin CA glue from Starbond. Now that the glue is set, we're, we're able to trim this piece up. Just taking some very light cuts here. Again, this isn't supported. Uh, being aggressive here could really harm you. Uh, I did leave a fairly decent size waste block on the on the end of this so I'm, I'm fairly confident that there's not going to be anything bad happen here but if you do happen to get a catch it could definitely be uh, catastrophic that's for sure We're all set up and ready for hollowing. What do you think about our piece? It is very cool. Beautiful color blends. Anyway, <laughs> this is the One Way Captive System from OneWay.ca. It does have a laser on it. And there's been a lot of people wondering really how this is used. Well, here is the wall thickness that I have it set at now. So essentially when that laser falls off the edge of the form here, that means that you've achieved that wall thickness. Uh, it does have a modified laser, and uh, this is a laser that you can mount on a gun. 
And all I had to do was order that, drill this hole, hole out a little larger for it to fit into, and lengthen the rod. And it was quite an easy modification. All right. Let's uh, let's see what this beautiful vase, how hard it's going to be. It's going to be kind of, it is going to be rough starting off because it's not even on the inside. So we'll see how that goes. So you would think working on a form like this would be fairly easy. And if I was right-handed, I could have done this with the Hercules. Would have been a little tough at the bottom, but uh, maybe if you had a longer handle on the Hercules where you could get some leverage, it would have been fine. But I'm not, I'm left-handed, so working over the lathe bed is not comfortable for me. So this is why I like to use the captive system that One Way has here. And uh, anyway, there were a couple of bumps in the road here. Uh, the transition from the burl upwards to the top of the vase was very tough to, to deal with. I was getting some, some chip out and some tear out there. Uh, but for the most part, the turning on this piece on the inside went fairly easy. The only thing that was kind of irritating was, of course, you're getting a lot of resin shavings. So if you've got wood and resin combinations, typically those resin shavings will be broke apart and they're not going to actually stay together and and clog up the inside of the vase and wrap around the tool but that's what i was dealing with up near the top of this anyway regardless uh the system worked flawlessly didn't have any issues with it except for just a couple of scary moments and if you watch me you'll see me every every now and then check to make sure that the laser hasn't moved <laughs> I, I do have this fear that I'll forget to lock the laser down really good and it'll move and then I'll just be turning and all of a sudden go right out through the side of one of these pieces. But because of the open form on this piece, it was easy to extract the shavings anyway. Uh, like I said, when I wrapped around the tool, it gets kind of a pain. And then actually what happens is so much the shavings will build up on the shaft of the tool where you can't push the cutter <laughs> into the side. So other than that, it worked great. So here's some laser shots. And so when that laser elongates on the side of the vessel, it just can't see anymore right there then you know that you've achieved the wall thickness that you have set between the laser and the cutter. I keep forgetting that there's a lot of people that watch my videos that are not turners and they're not familiar with the terminology or basically how a lot of the tools work. So, you know, I'll, I'll do my best in the future to try and cover these things so that everybody's kind of in the know. But... Um, <laughs> The stuff comes to me so naturally that I don't even think about it sometimes. So I do apologize for that for the non-turners that are watching. But uh, the goal of this channel is to educate people as well. So I'll work on it and, and do my best in the future here. Fred, right, I thought I'd give you a shot of the inside before we start sanding. Uh, this area down in here, uh, the transition from the burl to the resin. Oh, man. I almost blew through there a couple of times. You can see there's a little bit of tear out here. Uh, it's getting too thin, so I'm just gonna have to sand it. We're gonna do a resin coat on the inside and the outside of this piece, so it should be fine. There is one little bubble or tear out or something there. But um, yeah, man, I'm really digging the colors in this thing. It's really cool. All right, sand the next. These are the three and a half inch stipple discs from sandpaper.ca. And when I was when I said that things were getting a little thin, they weren't. They're not thin. But if you got another catch, <laughs> then if you have to turn that away, then it may have been getting too thin. On the inside of this piece, I was having the feedback through the tool on this this long shaft. I find it's very hard 
to get lumps and bumps out. So you'll see me uh, use the hand sanding there and then once I've got it flat I'll go back to the power sanding and I don't stay in one spot. I always constantly move the drill. And again, body position with the drill tight into your body. Take the strain off your arms and off your, off your shoulders and your elbows is the best way to power sand on the outside like this I find anyway. But um, I do find it's sometimes really hard to get feedback from the tool and then sometimes you have to um, do some hand sanding. Nobody likes that. Just a few bubbles on the outside of this piece so that's what the UV resin is for. Once it cured up after three minutes then I was able to just grind it back to the surface and carry on sanding. And if you're curious, on the inside and the outside of this piece, it was sanded from 60 to 220. Thought we would try something different this time. This is the fast cure, one to two hour. We'll do a uh, top coat finish with that and see how it performs. Gotta be careful with this stuff. You can't leave it in the cup too long because it will cure pretty fast. And I'm gonna use a barbecue brush. Silicone one to put it on. So you never know until you're going to try and I'm always interested in trying new techniques to see if they work or they don't work. Uh, this epoxy is used, mainly used, for areas that's probably too deep for the UV resin to, to, uh, to be used. So that's the primary use for this and I don't use it enough because there's probably some spots where I could have used it in the past and, and didn't. But uh, hey, you know, I'm always looking to improve things and I thought I would give this a shot. It still worked. If you can keep it warm and thin, I think that this will work, but at the very least, we're gonna get the wood sealed up so that tomorrow when we do the second coat, uh, I'll probably use Aircast or Pro Series tomorrow. It should go on and we shouldn't have any issues with bubbles. See, it's already starting to harden up. This is the good thing about it, and this is actually one of the bad things about it because the good thing is this can probably go right into my clean room now and um, not be on a rotisserie and it's probably not gonna sag. It does look good in areas. Well, there it is. Awesome color separation. This area up here, just absolutely incredible. And you know, parts of this where it is, it looks perfect. And at least that burrow will be sealed up. Second coat tomorrow should be just great. Here's what the inside looks like. Just can't get it to lay out flat. It just, it cures up too fast. Anyway, we will see you tomorrow for the second coat. All right, so we're gonna have to change it up on this piece a little bit. Uh, I realize I might, you know, I'm wearing shorts, but it's actually too cool here in the workshop for these finishes to cure properly of these resin finishes. This one was fine, and you know, we did a good job covering up all the wood, but as far as trying to lay it out flat is concerned, uh, it's just not gonna work. Uh, it's not meant for this, but uh, it certainly filled in all these little holes that we had. So that is great and um, it also sealed up the wood. So now what I think we'll do is we'll just sand this back inside and out and throw a coat of water lux on it and that may be um, all that we'll need. So if it was warmer in the workshop, then I would leave it spinning here on the lathe for three hours and it should cure up in that time frame. Uh, this piece won't fit on my rotisserie in my clean room just because of the shape of it. So uh, that's why we're using water lux. So the goal now is to level out any of the epoxy that was on there that, that didn't lay out flat. So that's what I'm doing here. So I just started sanding at 220. Uh, on the outside, it was actually fairly easy. A little more difficult to do on the inside, but the great thing about using that top coat of epoxy was that it did fill in all of these little voids and holes that were inside and outside the piece. So, you know, that there you would have had to deal with it in some other manner so anyway it was sanded from 220 to 800 and then of course it's going to be buffed like i usually do with the triple e buff buffing compound and then once that's done we'll clean it up with some denatured alcohol and get 
our, well, technically our second coat of finish on. This is the first coat of Waterlux gloss and hopefully the last coat. What we'll see. I don't know if we've ever had a color separation blend that's as nice as this, to be honest with you. They are just really combined really nicely. All the elements in there, very cool. It might need one more coat. Spectacular. Yeah, that right there. That maple burl underneath of it. Very nice. Uh, this, when it's lit up, is gonna be really cool looking. All right, anyway, I'm gonna do, uh, well, I'm gonna do the next coat the same way that I did this coat, and we'll see you when we're doing the base. Let me know in the comments what you think. Beauty. So it is the next day and we are ready to remove the waste block off the bottom of this. Uh, I'm not going to lie, I was a little worried, quite a bit of overhang off of that vacuum chuck, but in the end it it, uh, it was a non-issue. It was on there pretty darn good. Uh, as far as uh, finishing the bottom on this, after I get, got rid of the waste block, I sand it from 80 to 500. Now I got a special little request for you guys coming up here uh, at the outro, so please stick around and thanks a lot for watching the video. I really do appreciate it. Well, what do you think about this beautiful vase? I mean, you could call it a, a deep bowl if you wanted to, but for me it's more vase shaped. Ah, uh, really, really loving the green in this. Here is the bottom. As per normal, I'm going to finish on it because I'm running out of time here. Um, I was able to sign on the wood and not on the resin, so that's always good. Uh, it was a fun project. Uh, <laughs> I was a little worried when the uh, the epoxy first went into the into the uh, pressure pot. I wasn't sure how this was going to work out. There are a couple of bubbles in there. Probably notice them when um, when I light this from above, which I think is going to be really, really cool looking, and that'll be at the end. Uh, I'll give you some sizes. I'll put the metric conversion up on the screen here. So it is seven and five eighths inches tall and eight and a quarter at its widest point. Uh, the wall thickness. This is actually fairly thick. It's actually thinner down inside. I'd say it's anywhere from three eighths to a quarter of an inch. And I absolutely love this. And I hope Nicola does. That's that's Craig's wife's name. So hopefully she really likes this piece because I certainly do. I think it's beautiful. I'm gonna set this down. So the one thing that I've been really procrastinating on is getting a merch line up and running. So, uh, you know, the wife and I were talking the other night and, and I said, it would be really cool if I could go to my subscribers and the people that watch my videos and say, hey, if you've got an idea, a slogan for a shirt, uh, you know, th this kind of stuff, uh, please send me an email to spraguewoodturning at gmail.com and that way I can credit you if, if we, you know, move forward with your design and or your slogan or whatever, you know, the bucket, the bucket struggle is real or whatever. And uh, anyway, I'm gonna put this logo, I'm gonna make it larger, maybe center it, uh, maybe put it on the back. Anyway, I will take all of your suggestions and uh, hey, if we pick your idea, I'll credit you and uh, get, send you a free shirt too, or a hat or whatever it is that we're gonna do. But uh, this is one of the great things that I like about having a YouTube channel is I could talk to you guys each week and you know, we can, we can kind of develop this together instead of just me making stuff and go, here.
So I really like the fact that uh, I can get you guys involved. So please do that. Uh, the other thing is, don't forget about Designer Epoxy's promotion on my channel right now. Five free color bags, free shipping within continental USA and Canada, and of course 10% off your order when you use code INLAYGYM at checkout. That's a fantastic deal. At this time of filming, we are not over 105,000. So what I want to do is, uh, I've got, well it's not really so much a Halloween theme coming up next week, but anyway, I'll, it's an all black. Um, resin pour. <laughs> I'll go with that. And um, so, you know, that's Halloween-ish, isn't it? So that'll be next week. And then after that, we'll do the, uh, we'll do the draw for the 105,000 subscriber giveaway. Uh, what else? I guess I should mention that I do have business Facebook. So you can do a search for Sprague Wood Turning on Facebook. And I also have Instagram as well. And, um, I don't really do a whole lot on Instagram. I do a little bit on Facebook. I probably should do more than I do, but anyway, I thought I would mention that I do have those two platforms. So if you're on Instagram or Facebook, check me out and you can uh, follow me along there too. All right, well, that's it. Uh, take care, stay safe. Don't forget the bell. Please share my videos with your friends. That is the largest way for me to build my presence here on YouTube. And of course, that thumbs up will always help with the anal analytics and uh, push my content to others. All right, see you next week. Have a great weekend.